Good morning, and today we'll talk about uh, some keywords in a pediatric anesthesia. We can first go over some of the definitions we frequently use in pediatric anesthesia, and one of them is prematurity. A preterm child is any child that's born prior to 37 weeks of gestation. Postconceptual age, well, it's the number of weeks of gestation plus the number of weeks post-birth. So if a child is born around 30 weeks of gestation and is four weeks today, its postconceptual age would be 34 weeks. A low birth weight child is a child that weighs less than 2,500 grams at birth, and a very low birth weight child is one that weighs less than 1,500 grams. Small for gestational age are babies that are less than the 10th percentile. And according to the Center for Disease Control, the leading cause of infant mortality is not congenital deformities, but actually prematurity. So whenever you look at a child, especially when you're doing a pre-op or pre-anesthetic evaluation, you need to know if the child is growing as per its milestones. Um, one way is look at this chart and you can kind of compare. The easy things or the few things that you really need to remember is a child can hold its head up around three to four months of age. And if it can't hold its head up around five months of age, you know that it's definitely delayed. This is, the second important thing is rolling. Children start rolling from the supine to the prone position around four to five months of age, and that's normal. And they can sit up without support around seven months of age. Try to pull up to a standing position about 10 months of age. First steps is around the first birthday, first words around first birthday too. They can start naming objects around 10 to 18 months. And around 15 months is when they start saying no. And of course, that's because we say no. Um, start running around two years of age. Separation anxiety that's important for us to consider, it starts around nine months of age. In some children who've never left home and always with the parents, it could start as early as six months of age. So when you have to give verset, think about that usually never before nine months of age, and some kids maybe, but usually never. A few words on neonatal apnea, hypoxia, and its physiology. You know, when adults and older children are exposed to hypoxia, we tend to breathe a faster rate. There's an increase in our ventilatory drive for a prolonged period of time before we crash. But in newborns, preterms, this drive, this transient increase in respiratory rate following a period of hypoxemia or when they're exposed to hypoxemia is very, very short-lived. And then following this transient increase, there's a decrease in ventilation and then apnea and bradycardia and arrest. Now this ventilatory drive, even though it is um, short-lived, it's way shorter when these kids are acidotic or hypothermic or hypercarbic. Um, it should be magnesium toxicity in the neonates. So whom do you see this in? It's usually those children who are born to moms who have been on magnesium for either eclampsia or preeclampsia. When you look at these children, they appear to be sedated and they're really floppy. So one of the differential diagnoses when you look at a child who's floppy is ask, was the mom on magnesium? That's one thing that you can exclude. Um, the treatment, of course, is calcium, but remember it's always ABCs, treat the airway, look at the oxygenation, whether they're circulating well or not. Um, moving on to uh, pediatric temperature and regulation, one thing I did forget to put in that box, or I put it, I don't know what happened. Um, when you induce anesthesia, well, even before, our core temperature is higher than our peripheral temperature. So when you induce general anesthesia in the operating room, there's redistribution of heat, and so our core temperature does drop a little. So that's one of the first things that could happen when you induce, and that should have been there. I apologize for that. But the mechanisms, the other mechanisms of heat loss in the operating room are 
radiation that's the most important. 40 to 60 percent of the time the heat loss is because of radiant heat loss. 15 to 20 percent is convection. Conduction is around 5 percent, not too much, and evaporation of course a little higher when a whole belly is exposed and like gastroschisis and all the guts out. But otherwise it's about 5 percent. Um, how do you prevent radiant heat loss? Re heat the whole room up. Once the ambient temperature is higher and everything around the infant and the child is higher, there's that heat that's radiated to the child and hence keeps the child warm. But if everything else in the operating room is cold, the child gives away this radiant heat and gets cold. Convection loss can be, pre can be prevented by just putting a sheet of cloth on this child and so the convection wind cycles are taken away, that effect is taken away and heat loss is prevented. Now why do children get, <coughs> or why are children more prone to hypothermia in the operating room than us adults? It's because these children have a la large surface area to weight ratio when you look at them. They lack insulating flat fat, especially the preterm infants and the neonates and newborn hence they lose heat, obviously. They have a flaccid open posture versus we adults, when we get cold, we just curl up, cuddle up and conserve that heat. Children don't do that. They also have an impaired thermoregulatory ability just because they're still growing and maturing. And in preterm infants, the dermis is really not well keratinized, hence the skin is really thin, they lose heat quicker. What do we do to maintain temperature when we get cold? You and me will increase physical activity and hence increase the heat production, keep ourselves warmer. But children, if they're over five months of age and even adults, we can shiver, increase oxygen, increases the oxygen consumption, but also produces heat. Less than five or six months of age, children don't shiver. So they do what's called non-shivering thermogenesis. A word on non-shivering thermogenesis, it's nothing but um, hypothermia-induced increased oxygen consumption and heat production. It's not inhibited by muscle relaxants. So if you give, if you paralyze a child, doesn't mean they'll not do this. They still will do it. So that's why it's important to keep children warm in the operating room. It occurs through the metabolism of brown fat. It's inhibited by um, surgical sympathectomy or the use of beta blockade. What's brown fat? It's about <coughs> two to six percent of a body weight of the infants, and mainly located between the scapula and in the axilla. It's a highly specialized tissue. It contains multinucleated cells. It has numerous mitochondria and also abundant vascular supply and is densely innervated especially uh, because of the beta sympathetic nervous system. Why are we so concerned about hypothermia? Because it's got effects. What does it do? It delays awakening, causes cardiac irritability, especially those of you who've been in the cardiac room. When you start rewarming a patient, you see arrhythmias, and that's pretty common if a child's really cold. Um, respiratory depression, ventilatory drives removed. Uh, from hypothermia. It increases the pulmonary vascular resistance and if children have open shunts, you can cause reversal of shunt and hypoxemia. It alters the drug metabolism so these drugs don't get metabolized and hence the drug effects remain in these children and that could be another factor for delayed awakening. Of course, it causes coagulation abnormalities, wound healing is affected and if they're old enough to shiver, oxygen consumption goes up by 200 to 400 percent. And there is a shift of the oxygen hemoglobin curve to the left. A few words on fetal circulation. So in utero, there's oxygenated blood that comes from the placenta through the umbilical vein, goes to the um, IVC, the inferior vena cava, into the right atrium. In the right atrium, because of the presence of what's called the crista dividends, 
this blood that's oxygenated is shunted or made to flow through the uh, foramen ovale into the left atrium, left atrium to the left ventricle, and then the aorta. Deoxygenated blood comes through the superior vena cava into the right atrium, and that, again, with the help of crystal dividends, the flow is directed into the right ventricle, the pulmonary artery. The blood that's the deoxygenated blood in the pulmonary artery, 90% of that is shunted through the ductus arteriosus into the descending aorta. So it's the head and the upper part of the upper extremities, especially the right side, that gets the oxygenated blood. The rest of the body gets kind of a deoxygenated blood in utero. So what happens following birth? The umbilical cord is clamped, and then the child takes its first breath. When this happens, the alveoli, which is fluid-filled, is now filled with air. It decreases the pulmonary vascular resistance, um, and then the systemic vascular resistance goes up because the cord is clamped now. And then, of course, this ductus arteriosus that closes and um, increase in the left atrial pressures causes closure of the foramen ovale too. A few words on a patent ductus arteriosus. So once a child is born, it, within about three hours of life, there is functional closure. The anatomical closure takes about three days or later. And um, the pulmonary vascular resistance, which is pretty high in utero, is normalized within the first day of life. But sometimes, this patent ductus arterius remains open, and it's more common in the preterm children. How do you treat this? Give endometacin. Of course, time heals it a majority of times. If that doesn't happen, give endometacin. And if that doesn't help, then surgical correction, either by a thoracotomy and ligation of the ductus arteriosus, or if they're a little older you can, and more robust, you can take them to the cat lab and do an interventional closure. But what would happen if you don't close the patent ductus arteriosus and let it be the way it is? Then these children could have pulmonary hypertension, possible congestive heart failure, depending on the amount of blood that's been um, shunted through the ductus arteriosus, can also give rise to arrhythmias. There are some situations when we really want the ductus arteriosus to be open. And to name a few, you have those children who have the interrupted aortic arch before surgery, you want the ductus arteriosus to be open. And also in those children that have critical aortic stenosis and hypoplastic left heart um, syndromes. These children, if the ductus closes, it's literally fatal and hence we use uh, prostaglandin E1 to help keep it open till the surgical correction occurs. To sum it, fetal circulation or intrauterine circulation, it's a high pulmonary vascular resistance, low systemic resistance, and there's a lot of shunting right to left, especially in the ductus arteriosus and uh, the foramen ovale. Once there's aeration of the lungs after birth, this pulmonary vascular resistance goes down. It's usually mediated by nitric oxide. And um, there's increase in systemic vascular resistance, reversal of shunts, and decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance. You could get a question on blood gas of a newborn um, or blood gas of a fetus. The PaO2 and the fetus is around 19 millimeters mercury. The first hour of life is around 62, and by the time they're adult and children, it's 99. Um, the other thing to remember would be the pH. In utero, it's around 7.29. First hour of birth, 7.36, and as they grow older, it comes to normal 7.4. You need to remember that the neonatal pulmonary circulation is extremely reactive. 
So hypoxia, hypercarbia, acidosis, hypothermia, they're all bad, bad, bad for children. And they can cause pulmonary vascular constriction and cause reversal of shunting and hypoxemia, especially when you take preterm children or newborn neonates in the operating room. Pay attention, make sure the child does not get hypoxemic or hypercarbic or hyper, hypothermic. Um, a newborn or a preterm's myocardium is still immature and hence it's less compliant than the adult myocardium. And because of that, it has a limited ability to increase contractility. This decreased compliance, of course, and it cannot increase the stroke volume. The stroke volume is relatively fixed in these children. And because the stroke volume is fixed, the cardiac output is extremely rate dependent. So a child gets bradycardic, the cardiac output decreases, and that could be detrimental to the baby. The cardiac output is rate dependent to about two years of age. Um, the sympathetic innervation is really incomplete in children till about five years of age. The um, parasympathetic is well formed, but the sympathetic part of the autonomic nervous system takes about four to five years of a child's life to get totally mature, and hence they're more prone, they're more vagal. Um, a few words on cardiac output in the newborns. It's about 350 ml per kilo. As they get older, by two months of age, they need about 200 ml per kilo and decreases to the adult levels by about two years of age, two to three years of age. Um, in children, just remember they, their uh, barrier reflex activity is impaired and hence if they have a 10% decrease in blood volume because of hemorrhage, they will have a 15 to 30% decrease in the mean arterial pressure. So having a child you volumic is extremely important. Um, persistent fetal circulation is nothing but persistent pulmonary hypertension. That's that's what it is in utero. They live on high uh, pulmonary vascular resistance. Um, things to remember about persistent fetal circulation is they shunt because of increased pulmonary vascular resistance. So they're hypoxemic when you see them. Point to remember though is these kids have a faster rate of IV induction and a slower rate of inhalational induction. So this could be one of your board questions. The causes of pulmonary, uh, persistent pulmonary hypertension is primary. Really, we don't know what causes it they're born, they still remain to have um, persistent pulmonary hypertension and are shunting. The secondary causes are anything that could affect the lungs, like meconium aspiration and pneumonia, respiratory distress. <coughs> Congenital diaphragmatic hernia falls second on your list of the causes for, um, secondary causes for persistent pulmonary hypertension. And these kids, if they're not doing well, they may have to be on ECMO. Acidosis, hypothermia, sepsis, hypotension all cause an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance and reversal of shunts. The other factor is, of course, our mechanical ventilation. Or if you have a child whose lungs are not well uh, ventilated or well aerated or inflated, you could get um, persistent pulmonary hypertension. How do you treat, prevent hypoxia? Prevention of hypoxia is making sure that the patient's oxygenated well. Decrease the CO2 if the patient is hypercarbic. And then make sure that the blood pressure is systemic, blood pressure is normal and not hypotensive. And then you don't want patients to be acidotic because it worsens, worsens pulmonary vascular resistance. Hence, a little bit of alkalosis helps these kids. You can try nitric oxide inhalational or use prostacyclin IV. And then if all else fails, you can start um, ECMO on these kids. A few words that 
could uh, um, come in your birds would be oxygen consumption in a neonate. It's about 6 ml per kilo per minute versus 3 to 4 ml per kilo in adults. Children have a higher minute ventilation. They have higher closing volumes and the rib cage is horizontal versus in adults it is more oblique, I guess. Um, the horizontal to the oblique changes occurs once a child gets erect and starts walking around. Um, the alveoli are still decreased when they're born. It keeps increasing till about six years of age to the adult, adult levels. Functional residual capacity in a neonate that's healthy and awake is no different from that of an adult. It's only under general anesthesia that the functional residual capacity is lower. So the question on your boards could be functional residual capacity in adults is lower or higher than in, uh, in children versus adults. And a normal, healthy uh, neonate, it's uh, no different than um, an adult. The diaphragm has less oxidative fibers and hence they could tire more quickly if the work of breathing is increased. Again, a few things that we need, whether it comes in your boards or not is secondary, but we really need to remember that the respiratory rate in the newborn is about 50 times a minute compared to an adult that's about 12. Tidal volumes per kilo, there is no difference. Minute ventilation is much higher in the neonate and younger children than the adult. So is the alveolar ventilation. If you look at the dead space ventilation, the dead space to tidal volume ratio, it's not different. Oxygen consumption is way higher in the newborn period than in the adult life. Functional residual capacity, ml per kilo in healthy neonates is the same as adults. Um, yeah, there's not much difference. One of the questions on your boards is the reason why inhalational induction is faster in children than in adults, and why would we not do an inhalational induction in an adult when they ask, I don't want an IV, you know? And that's the reason. Children have a high minute ventilation to functional residual capacity ratio, and along with a higher cardiac output and an increased amount of uh, this cardiac output going to vessel-rich organs, these children have a rapid inhalational induction. The other thing to remember is the children have lower blood gas partial coefficients, and hence that also helps with faster induction, inhalational induction. Again, left to right shunt, if these children have a, a left to right shunt, it barely increases inhalational induction unless the shunt is really huge. But if they have a right to left shunt, Inhalational induction is slowed, but the IV rate of induction is quicker. This is a chart on neonatal newborn resuscitation. Self-explanatory, just go over it. Now, should we use oxygen in a neonate when they're born um, and they are in distress? Well, when you go to labor delivery, make sure that you're not looking at the child's color to say whether this child is hypoxemic or not. This color is really not a good indicator. Make sure you have a pulse ox on in these children, and that's a better indicator. And if their saturations are low, then start resuscitating these children with just room air. And if the sats remain to be low, you can start titrating increased amount of oxygen by using an oxygen blender. If oxygen blender is not available, or if a child is bradycardic, even with room air resuscitation, then go up to 100% FiO2, resuscitate the child once the bradycardia is reversed and the heart rate goes up, then you can start titrating down on your oxygen requirements. I think a few years ago, there was a question on meconium aspiration. The 2010 guidelines, I think, or 2012, I forget, uh, came out with this saying, if the child is not vigorous, that's the only time when you do a DL 
laryngoscopy, intubate and suction the tracheal contents of meconium. Now, if the child is not vigorous, you attempt to do a DL and you cannot intubate, SATs are low or the patient is bradycardic, go ahead and do a bag mass positive pressure ventilation. And studies have shown that this really does not worsen the pulmonary, uh, uh, the lungs secondary to the meconium aspiration. But if the child is vigorous, even in the setting of meconium in the oropharynx, all you probably have to do is suction the oropharynx, but you don't have to suction the trachea, put a tube in, just leave the child alone. The kid's kicking around, leave the child alone. You don't have to do anything. Um, while you're resuscitating, resuscitating the child, don't forget that you may, need to make sure that the child is dried. And you're stimulating the child to breathe, take a big breath, and um, of course, oxygen administration is as necessary. Do not start with 100% FiO2. Preterm infant. Any child born prior to 37 weeks of gestation. Now, there are certain conditions that are exclusively a problem of the preterm infant, and they include respiratory distress syndrome because of surfactant deficiency, apneas, hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, and hyperbilirubinemia. Um, the two factors that's most important to us when they come to the operating room is the postoperative apnea bradycardia and the retinopathy of prematurity. Post-op apnea. I think we've gone through the definitions before. But apnea is absent breathing for 15 seconds or more. If it's less than 15 seconds, when the child gets bradycardic, you don't have to look at the number. If the child's bradycardic and even as saturations have been low, low for two or three seconds, is still apnea. The risk factors for postoperative apnea, the one on your list is prematurity, of course. Anemia is um, an independent risk factor. The others are the child already has a history of apnea and bradycardia at home, is on a monitor. You know this child is going to be more predisposed to apnea bradycardia following exposure to anesthesia. Children with bronchopulmonary dysplasia or any lung disease or congenital cardiac abnormalities, they could also be prone for um, apnea bradycardia post-anesthesia. A few words on the different types of apneas. You have the central, the obstructive, and the mixed. When we talk about postoperative apnea in, in children, it's usually the central one. It could be mixed, but mainly it's central. Again, etiology, multifactorial, multiple factors involved here. Um, the decreased ventilatory drive is also potentiated by our anesthetics. And you know, these children don't respond very well to hypoxemia. There's a very short period of transient increase in respiratory rate. But once you're exposed to anesthesia, that increase is also gone. And they fatigue very easily. I think we talked about uh, the diaphragm not being um, mature enough to have um, a high number of uh, fatigue-resistant muscles. There have been many studies which have looked at regional versus general anesthesia and the prevention of postoperative um, apnea in children. But if you look at them, all of them, if you've used a sedative agent or any agent for induction of anesthesia, even if it's just to start an IV, all of them predispose to postoperative apnea, bradycardia. Just regional anesthesia, there's one study that says with no medications given, even that has caused some amount of apnea bradycardia. So even though it decreases, it's not to say that it does not cause apnea bradycardia. How do you treat them? Stimulate them. Just do some blow by oxygen. Like we saw the child yesterday from uh, a status post pyloromyotomy. All you need to do is stimulate them a little. They breathe. Keep them on a monitor post-op. In severe cases, you may have to re-intubate these children. 
I have used um, stimulants like caffeine, about 10 milligrams per kilo of uh, um, caffeine citrate in these children to help with uh, their post-operative apnea. In our hospital, any child who's less than a preterm infant that's less than 60 weeks of post-conceptual age, we observe them overnight post-anesthesia on a monitor, an apnea bradycardia monitor. If this is a full-term infant and is less than 48 weeks of post-conceptual age, we still admit them post-anesthesia and monitor them overnight. Um, the incidence, of course, is greatest within four to six hours after anesthesia. Few words on retinopathy of prematurity. They're at risk at about 44, till about 44 weeks of post-conceptual age, irrespective of when they were born. Um, the cause is prematurity, and if we can prevent prematurity, we'll never see this. I wish we can. Um, our aim, though, because oxygen tension in the retinal artery has been implicated as a cause for uh, retinopathy of prematurity, we try to maintain their saturations around 88 to the low 90s, like 94%. Titrate your FiO2 to maintain saturations between 88 and 94 in the operating room. And that's the only thing we can do. I'll talk about this tomorrow. Thank you, folks.